right. How's it going, everybody? My name is John. We're talking about being wrong, which is some really uh, taboo topic sometimes, but uh, I think it's really important one to talk about, especially in emergency medicine. So welcome to Vegas. Everything that happens here stays here. Uh, is this being recorded? Oh, okay, well, it's going to be recorded too. So don't worry about that part. Um, but otherwise, it's going to stay on the internet, which is just about staying everywhere. Um, so here's what we're going to talk about. Misconceptions about being wrong, why successful people love being wrong, how it helps us grow, and then how to work with those who think they're never wrong, which never happens in the emergency department, ever. Um, what does it feel like to be wrong? Throw out some, some things. It feels bad. What else does it feel? Embarrassing. What else? Those are the only two emotions you feel when you're wrong. Scared. Scared, yeah, that's good. Disappointed, I agree. So I would argue that those are the feelings that you feel when you realize that you're wrong. Actually, feeling wrong is a lot like when you're Wiley Coyote chasing after the roadrunner. You've dropped seven anvils, they've all missed. You had dynamite blow up several different places. They didn't work. And finally, you've reached the end of the cliff and you didn't realize, oh, shoot, something happened. As soon as you realize you're off the cliff, those emotions come in. You're sad, disappointed, angry, embarrassed, all that other stuff. Being wrong itself is not actually emotion provoking. We often think that we're right. That's why we say the answers we say, and that's it. I literally just blew it up in your face. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I just want to make a point that we inherently want to be right. And we feel that we're right. And it's actually the realization that we've made a mistake that will dictate how you, um, how you grow from making a mistake. And I want you to think about this. What does it feel like when we realize we're wrong in the ER? Um, hold on to those emotions and, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the talk. So why do we always want to be right? Why do we always feel this way of this need to be right? And it started from when we were kids. You got good grades, you're a good kid in school. You got bad grades, you talked a lot, blah, 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 you're a bad kid. Um, it's ingrained in our emotions from the beginning. Look at all the testing we did. We had to pass tests, we had to do well in order to get where we are today. We're good people if we're right. If we're wrong or we get a bad grade, there's something wrong with us. But it's not about an issue about getting it right now, right? It, at this point, we need to understand why we were right. We need to understand what was uh, the thing that led us to our conclusions. There's this idea in business called founder syndrome. Founders of companies that are widely successful approached a topic, found a solution or creative idea and ran with it. They usually went against the grain. The problem is that founders often continue to go against the grain once they become successful and that leads them to make mistakes, even though um, they have this, they basically have this machismo about them. I, I went against the grain. I can keep going against the grain and keep making all these, pro make, um, these great successes, but it actually leads them down the wrong road. For example, the CEO of BlackBerry thought that our phones would always be used for email and only email. And now you see why BlackBerry doesn't, isn't very popular anymore. They lost the corner of the market. Our brains are designed uh, to not be rational sometimes. Biases, heuristics come in. We just talked a lot, a bit about, a lot about biases in our, in our last awesome talk. Um, our brains have these heuristics which are basically mental shortcuts that allow us to cut corners and, and be efficient. We use them a lot in the ER. Uh, one of them that we see is the uh, recognition heuristic. Allows us to see patterns or see a single thing and make a judgment, a snap judgment about it. It leads us to believe uh, as soon as we see ST elevations in a, an EKG that's a STEMI, we've got to call the cath lab and uh, get things going. They can also lead us down the wrong road. Uh, there's the recognition heuristic, um, sorry, the anchoring bias, we all know very well. There's also the availability heuristic, which put, puts undue weight on recent events that affect our memory. If we just missed a AAA and we have another patient come in for abdominal pain, we're going to think AAA right away. That's a natural thing. It's a shortcut that we take in our mind to try to make, not make a mistake. The biggest thing that I read about or, or one interesting piece is that we should really emphasize these throughout our medical training. It should start in medical school. It should continue throughout residency and continue into attending hood as well. We should talk about biases on our rounds, which I thought was a really interesting idea. These allow us to remind ourselves, oh, I had this bias when I was thinking about this thing. So maybe it wasn't as likely, but I wanted to put on my differential anyway. Um, and it's a really important thing. Another person or another place uh, argued that we have two systems of thinking. System one is basically rational or really quick responding to emotion, responding to what we see in front of us. And system two is that conscious effort, that complex computation. 
one often gets in the way of system number two, right? We often make snap judgments and that's what's necessary in the emergency department sometimes. But our complex uh, judgment also has to be made and, and, and make sure that we keep those complex ideas um, going forward. You are always thinking you're right can have consequences. We saw this the airline industry is a whole book about it written by an amazing doctor. Uh, it was a really good book um, called Checklists. Basically airplanes had more accidents before they had checklists than we made checklists. And then that translated into the operating room um, where we basically make sure that we have everything we need before we start. We have procedures that we do in the emergency department. We always do a timeout um, to make sure that we have everything we need. We're doing the right side, right patient, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's really important. Beyond the tangible consequences like doing the procedure on the wrong side of the patient or hitting a, a vessel that you may otherwise have not hit, there are psychological ones too. If we always think we're right, it means that everyone else is wrong, has to be wrong. And there's three ways that we process this. And the first is we assume that people are stupid, or sorry, they're, they're ignorant, so we have to educate them. And if after we've educated people, they still don't get it, well, then they must be stupid. And if even if we've really gone above and beyond to educating someone and they're, they're still, they're really not stupid people, then they must be evil. See, the thing is, when we think about being right all the time, it closes off our thinking. It doesn't allow us, it leads us to mistakes and causes us to treat each other terribly. If people are evil, we don't have to treat them well. And I think this goes beyond medicine. It goes beyond everything else. Um, but it's, it's an important, important value, I think. Uh, if we always think that we're right, uh, it's gonna lead us down the wrong road. But thinking that we're always right can have some evolutionary benefit and have some benefit to us as well. Basically, you're, if you think you're right, you're kind of fooling yourself. And if you fool yourself, then you can better fool others. And that can lead you um, to have, we do this in several areas, moral superiority, we have false personal narratives, we have self-inflation. And if we fool ourselves, it's easier to fool others. Um, it can get, help us get ahead and help us find a mate. Uh, it can help us get that promotion. Um, but I think what's most important about all of this stuff is that it's great to be right, but being wrong is also essentially human. It's the most human experience of us all. Um, this is a really cool TED talk if you guys have never seen it before. Um, don't fake it till you become, uh, fake it till you become it. Uh, don't fake it till you make it, fake it till you become it. And this person basically uh, argued that our, body, our bodies change our minds and our minds change our behavior and the behavior changes our outcome. It's this idea that, um, how, I think the, the simple, uh, the way that she explained was having that power pose before you approach a situation you're nervous, nervous about uh, can lead you to have a better mindset and the mindset can change your outcome, um, which is a really cool thing. So being wrong is how we grow. Uh, Thomas Edison had this famous quote um, that I'm not gonna read to you, um, but basically it keeps us thirsty for knowledge. That's why we study. If everything was out just getting the question right on the test, we would just flip through the questions as fast as we could looking at buzzwords and, and trying to get all the 100%. The reason we read the world explanation at the end of the question is we wanna understand, seek, we wanna seek deeper knowledge. As a human, our mo mind is programmed to want and imagine. It's, it's programmed to think and ponder. And if we don't do any of that stuff, uh, we're just robots, right? If we don't think and ponder, uh, or sorry, it, when we think and when we ponder, we have to question ourselves and we have to realize that we're wrong sometimes. As junior residents, um, it happens a lot. Uh, as a junior resident myself, I, I made many mistakes. I continue to make mistakes. It's, it's never ending. But I think an important part of this too is that we have to realize the environment has to be right for us to learn from our mistakes. Um, so junior people need to be asked, comfortable bringing up questions. Uh, the seniors need to be able to stop and listen um, and answer those questions. Uh, we all have to take a second and realize when we make a mistake that it's all right that we made a mistake as long as we learn from it. Um, sometimes the mistakes are really grave and sometimes they're, they're not that grave, but basically uh, it's important that we take that time and, and recognize that it's, uh, we all make a mistake. Realizing that we're wrong um, means that we can bounce back from experiences that we had that would have otherwise made a really negative impact on us. It's called resilience. Um, I'm not gonna get into resilience because I think it's a wellness talk for another time, 
but it also makes you wiser in the future making mistakes, right? The more time that you spend being wrong now, the more time you spend being right in the future. I think that was a really powerful uh, thing that came across. And just like everything else, being wrong is a skill. There's one CEO that actually puts his ideas and thoughts through two challenges. The first, he surrounds himself or herself with um, belief or assist a group of people that will question these ideas. The questioners are allow that person to get feedback from the outside and seek um, experiences from other people to see, you know, is, is, my, is my idea correct? It allows for deeper reflection as well. And then the other way you can do that, you don't have to have a, a big group of people surrounding you and telling you you're wrong all the time. Um, you can just do it in your own mind. What's something that I can think of that would make my idea be wrong? When we're proposing that differential diagnosis to our attending, you know, what's, what's one thing that we can think of extra that may add to the differential? What, what's something that, you know, maybe that's not the leading diagnosis anymore because of this little thing here. Um, it's something very important to, to think about. Again, when we surround ourselves with people that question us, it has to be done in a psychologically safe area um, and make sure that those people don't have repercussions for asking questions if we're in positions of power. Um, I think a really interesting part was question yourself and you'll find answers to questions no one has asked before as well and go beyond just uh, in the ED. So let's talk a little bit about persuading the unpersuadable. Um, we all operate on, on an if then um, access model, if you will. If our deadline is approaching, we're gonna rush to get it done. Um, if someone's crashing, then I'm gonna go and you know, ABC and, and D, IVO to monitor all that stuff. Sometimes it's hard for people to activate that if they have resistance to that. Uh, one person that was such was Steve Jobs, famously uh, with Apple and, and had huge successes, um, but he was also famously hard to persuade. Thankfully, he surrounded himself with people that questioned his ideas and really led him to have innovations that we all hold in our pockets. And I'm looking at a Mac right now. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing what, what accomplished when you uh, realize that you're wrong and you can learn from that experience as well. So basically, we're going to cover different types of personalities and how to deal with them and, and make sure that we open their mind a little bit as well. So in this situation, uh, the iPhone was coming out. They kept trying plastic as the cover because that was reliable, right? Plastic doesn't really break. And if it does break, it doesn't shatter in your pocket. That would lead to a lot of injuries and probably some lawsuits. Steve Jobs wanted to find a glass company that could make a shatterproof glass. He went to Steve Week, or sorry, Wendell Weeks, who was the CEO of Corning Glass Upstate New York, and said, hey, can you work with us in finding a shatterproof glass? He's like, I have no problem doing that. Find me someone that's technical enough to understand the, the things that I need to talk to them about. Steve Jobs didn't like that very much. He said, I'm technical enough. You can explain it to me. So Wendell Weeks turned the tables on him and said, can you just explain to me what you, exactly your process is that you want to accomplish here? Steve Jobs started explaining how to make glass and he realized a couple sentences in, I really don't know what I'm talking about. And that's when he said, that's when Weeks said, well, let me explain it to you and broke it down by chemical structure exactly what happened. He went back, uh, Steve Jobs invited him back to their headquarters in California and um, they figured it out. By the time the iPhone launched, he uh, got, a, uh, Mr. Weeks got an email from, from Steve Jobs saying, you know, without you, we couldn't have done it. So the basic principle is make sure the, to open someone's mind a little bit that they think they know everything, ask them to really explain it and break it down in the basic uh, principles. It allows them to maybe open their mind and realize maybe I don't know exactly what's going on here. And I would love your input on that as well. So there was a, an interesting uh, study that I saw. It basically surveyed a bunch of college students, took the college students um, and said, what are your successes and failures uh, based off of? Is it intrinsic? Is it my effort and my, my, um, and my choice? Or is it external forces like fate and luck and all this other stuff? They took those same people and split them into three groups. The first group, got, they basically said, we're, gonna, we're proposing a change to the grading system. So I want you to read these um, arguments as to why we should change it. And I want your feedback afterwards. The first group got a mildly uh, persuasive argument saying, this is pretty good. We've researched it at other institutions. It worked out pretty well. Um, the next group got a, this is the best idea ever kind of argument and you should have no qualms about it. Vote yes to changing everything. And the last one got a non-persuasive argument that just didn't do anything. Um, what they found was that people that were stubborn, people that 
relied intrinsically. They thought everything is dependent on their effort and choice. Favored, uh, didn't have any favored internal control. They were unmoved by the light argument and actually like rubber banded against the strong argument. They actually like, were like, no, this is the worst idea ever because it was someone else telling them what to think. And this applies to Steve Jobs' job. Um, it was really interesting. Uh, the person that, the engineer that came up with the idea for Apple TV uh, was using his Mac one day and was like, I really don't like that I have to move my Mac around. I want to listen to music all the time. So why don't I come up with, why don't we, and went to Jobs like, hey, I have this idea. Why don't we make something that could transport media? And Jobs like, no, nah, it's a dumb idea. I don't like it. Snap back right away. So instead, two months later, um, he planted a seed in his head. He went and opened him up for questioning. That was actually a really important thing. Um, the engineer asked Steve, like, hey, you know, it's probably unlikely every person is going to have a Mac in every room in their house. Why don't we make a device instead that could set, like, play media in different places? That question and planted the seed in the head allowed Jobs to like open up a little bit there and like say, okay, maybe, you know, that's a pretty good idea. And they actually ran with the idea. And then the uh, Apple TV came out of it. Um, when we ask people questions, it softens their defenses. They have to lower their gate to give us an answer. So it allows the, maybe someone that has a very closed mind to maybe open up just a little bit and maybe you can enter that, that space a bit. Narcissists, uh, always, think they're, <laughs> always think they're right generally. They're, they think they're superior and special. Steve Jobs is no different. He had a stakeholders meeting where he proposed a kind of not really thought out idea. And the stakeholder that was at the, the meeting realized, you know what, Steve Jobs has these narcissistic tendencies. Let me help him out a little bit here before I give him some feedback. He started his comment with, Mr. Jobs, you are a bright and influential man. And he paused. And Steve Jobs from the stage is like, this is going to be good. Go ahead, what do you have? And then he gave his critique of what was going on. And Instead of snapping closed, like Jaws is known to do, he actually was wide open. He's like, you know, you make some good points. We didn't think everything through. I'll come back with a better idea on our next shareholders meeting. Um, the key is to praise, and this goes for everybody, not just narcissists. Um, when you're giving someone feedback, if you really want to um, give them effective feedback, we always have been told to never do the sandwich method. Give them a little bit of praise, then the feedback, and then a little bit of praise. Because as naturally, we remember the first and the last things of everything people say. The middle is kind of somewhere lost. So instead, you can give a person um, a little bit of praise in an area different than what you're critiquing, and then give them the feedback on the area you want to critique. So if someone made a poor decision, you can say, wow, that was a really creative idea. Um, I really appreciate your creativity when you come up with these solutions. But I think the decision that you made wasn't the best, and this is why. It allows the, the, we become more open to feedback when we're reminded of a strength because it's like a little bit of, a little nugget of, oh, I did okay, but I need to work on this thing. Um, so this is how you work with a narcissistic people. And they're just people that just wanna argue. They're there, they dominate, they just wanna, they want to crush the competition. So you should push back on them. They're just some people you just gotta push back on, that's just reality. They actually did a really interesting survey. CEOs were appointing people for uh, chair um, board positions in their companies. And what they found is that people that pushed back on the CEO before they agreed with them were more likely to get the chair position. I don't know the exact reasons why, um, but the, uh, the thought that I had was like, you don't want to push over in a powerful position, right? You want to be able to go back and forth to someone that you can rely on, make them part of that feedback that we talked about before that can give you critiques on what your ideas are. Jobs actually took this, um, the, Apple, um, the Apple employees actually made a, an award for people that would push back on Jobs a lot. And the person that won the award every year, Jobs found out later it was an award that they made up and they would actually appoint them to place uh, positions of power in the, in the company because he realized these are people that clearly are respected by my, 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 like the people that they work with and they can question me effectively, so we might as well put them somewhere important. All right, so in conclusion, being wrong is okay, even in the ER, as long as you learn from it. Uh, we will all make mistakes, no matter what. You're gonna keep making mistakes, you're human. Um, being wrong allows us to grow, as long as you realize those mistakes and are open to them. The ocean, uh, there's an interesting idea, like we have many options to respond to, to making mistakes. We have many options available to us when we are making choices, but the only option we never have, the only option we do not have is perfection. 
So question yourself and you'll find the answers to questions no one has asked before. And I really like this um, old adage, I've learned so much from my mistakes, I intend to make many, many more. So what does it feel like when you're wrong in the ER? I want your, your emotions. What does it feel like when you realize that you're wrong in the ER? I'll change that because I blew it up on you before. You always get this thing. Hey, remember that patient you had? That's like the worst couple, couple words you can have sometimes. What does it feel like? What? Yeah, that word is recorded, Chrissy, come on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. It feels really bad. Uh, it doesn't feel right. ED, ED is a really challenging place to be wrong because we have lives in our hands sometimes. A lot of the time, we can feel guilty that we missed something. We have to make quick, uh, we have to make quick decisions, right? We have all that system one, all of that heuristic and bias that we have to keep in mind. And a lot of time we, sometimes we don't feel like we can stop and ask people the questions we want to ask them. Right? We're in a rush to see that seventh patient that we just picked up. Um, rather than look at the ED as a place where error is waiting at every turn, I think it's also important to recognize um, how rich the ER is a place to learn from mistakes because we're going to make them constantly. It's just it's how we learn. It's how we grow. If you're open to learning, you're going to get better with time. And if you make the same mistakes over and over, um, or you won't make the same mistakes over and over again if you're open to the learning. Um, and I think a really important part is uh, when we give these feedbacks, remember the ways to work with people that um, always think that they're right, but always realize the setting that you're giving your feedback in. You know, if it's the middle of a crazy shift, it may not be the best, by the way, you remember that patient we had, maybe wait towards the end of the shift and they're finishing up their note and they don't have a million places to be, um, to give it back. Uh, and be mindful of your language. Obviously the, the language you use can support growth versus harbor some, uh, make us close our shell. A little bit. All right. Comments. There's no. I don't know. You can have questions too. I guess. It's up to you. Yeah. 